I'm Mandy Hubbard. I'm a QA architect with Care.com HomePay, and I'm excited to share with you how our team is using Jenkins to build containerized microservices. I'm guessing since you're here that Jenkins is pretty important to you, and I'm telling you that for our team it's critical. It's indispensable. Let me paint a picture for you. It's 4.30 on a Friday, you're trying to get a release out the door, and your Jenkins server crashes. It doesn't really matter what happened. It could be a hardware failure, fat finger accident, or the zombie apocalypse. It is toast. What are you going to do? How long did it take you to perfect your Jenkins server, to configure all your plugins and create all those credential sets and jobs? Hopefully, you at least have a backup of your Jenkins home directory, but you're still going to have to work with IT all weekend long to procure a new server, install it, configure Jenkins, restore your backup, and then regression test Jenkins itself to make sure you're ready to go on Monday. Can I get a show of hands? Has anyone ever had that experience? No. Okay, how many of you have nightmares about this experience? Okay, that's my worst nightmare. But guess what? For the engineering team at care.com homepay, our Jenkins server is completely indispensable, yet also disposable. I know, indispensable, disposable, these are contradictory terms. It can't be both. Well, I'm going to show you how it can be both and how it's the best way to maximize your use of Jenkins. But first, let me tell you why it's important to Care.com HomePay. Care.com is the world's largest online platform for families to find and manage care. Families use our services to find babysitters, nannies, pet care, elderly care, and so forth. We also help businesses provide care benefits to their employees. The home pay division is the leading provider of payroll and tax services for household employees, caregivers, in all 50 states. So we move money between accounts and we interact with the IRS doing tax filings. So we're under a lot of the same regulations and restrictions of a financial services institution. Our processes must be solid. And we've been doing this for 25 years. We innovated in creating the space, and now we're innovating in the way we do our jobs. Caregivers depend on our services to get their paychecks, and our clients depend on our services to send those paychecks and to stay on top of their tax filings. That's our pledge to them. So we need to be able to make sure we can reliably release the services that provide those services to our clients. So last summer, I joined a new team at Care.com HomePay that was tasked with two things. Deconstruct a monolithic application into containerized microservices and transform a traditional IT department into a dynamic and agile engineering team that could help the business achieve its goal of digital transformation. So the first thing we needed to do in order to achieve these goals was to create a continuous integration and delivery pipeline. And for this, I chose Jenkins, which leads me to why Jenkins is important to me. I've spent over 15 years of my career leading software QA teams and being held accountable for the quality of the software that was released. I also spent a year and a half as a support engineer, which confirmed that I would much rather work to ensure quality before the software is released than to deal with poor quality once it's in the hands of the customer. I'm in this because I care about quality. I know, everyone says they care about quality. Hey, do we like quality? Yeah, quality's great. You want some bacon? Bacon's great too. What do we mean? What does it mean to us in this room who are responsible for ensuring that the software release actually does what it's intended to do? So for me, quality is the ability to reliably release software in a way that minimizes regressions. It's about thinking about quality throughout the entire process, not just tacking on some tests at the end. And it's about eliminating those huge merge conflicts at the end of a release cycle. That's what quality means to me, and that's continuous integration. The next level is continuous delivery, which I'll show you later in a demo. And every business cares about quality. Why do businesses care about quality? Because quality is what allows the business to move fast. Have any of you heard the old adage, why do cars have brakes? So they can go fast. Without brakes, cars can never go full throttle and still be able to stop reliably. Likewise, it's by building quality software and by following processes with built-in quality checks that allow developers 
to confidently release software quickly. Fortunately, releasing software, quality software, is simple, right? It really is. Developers commit code regularly, preferably daily, to a, an upstream master. Every commit triggers an automated build and test, and the code is only merged into master if all the tests pass. It's really simple. We need a good process and some discipline. The problem is this relies on developers to have discipline, and developers are humans. We make mistakes. We also may feel pressure to cut corners in our processes when we're under deadlines. The good news is that with Jenkins, we can automate the entire end-to-end -end continuous delivery pipeline so that minimal human intervention is required. Let me talk you through what this looks like for my team. We use GitHub as our source control management system. So our organization, our, our company is HomePay, but for the purposes of the demo and the presentation, I've got an organization called DevMandy, which also happens to be my Twitter handle. My organization is DevMandy, and I have two developers. I have an organization account where we have repos from which we release software, and then the individual developers, we have our own GitHub accounts. When I'm ready to develop a new feature, the first thing I do is create a fork of my upstream into my origin. This is essentially a mirror image of whatever's in the repo at the time I create the fork. I then clone my fork to my local development machine where I'm going to write my code and test. I'm going to rebase regularly from master so that I don't get too far out of sync. And then when my code is complete, I'm going to commit it and push it back to my origin. I'm then going to open a pull request, usually known as a PR, asking that my code be merged into the master branch, which is from where we're going to release. So starting with the creation of this PR, we're going to start an end-to-end -end communication loop between GitHub and Jenkins. I'm going to walk you through what that looks like, and don't worry, when I'm done, I'll show you how we configured that. So picking up with the PR. When I open this PR, GitHub sends a notification to Jenkins indicating that a PR was open. Jenkins checks out this PR and builds and tests. While Jenkins is building and testing, the friendly little squash and merge box that we're used to seeing is going to be disabled. That code is not getting merged. Instead, we've got a couple of caution signs letting us know that the quality checks haven't completed. Now, if this build fails for any reason, maybe it doesn't compile, or we have a test failure, or I've checked in code, but I didn't check in unit tests, and so now our code coverage uh, percentages aren't met, whatever quality checks we define in our Jenkins file, if any of those aren't met, this green box is going to stay disabled. We're not going to ignore failing tests or poor coverage numbers and push that code in any way. That's not happening. Jenkins is going to send the status back to GitHub when the build is complete. When the build is successful, Jenkins is going to send that back to GitHub. Now my squash and merge box is back. Jenkins is also going to send a notification to my dev team in a Slack channel, letting them know that there's a PR that's been through all the quality checks that's just waiting on a developer's review and merge. Now when we squash and merge this button, or squash and merge this code, it's going to send another event. This is a push event. We're pushing to our master branch. So that's going to send another notification to Jenkins. Jenkins is going to build and test again. But this time, we have our Jenkins file written in such a way that it knows whether we're doing a pull request or a master. So every commit to the master branch is intended for release. So in addition to the test we ran on the pull request, we might want to run an additional battery of tests, like maybe performance tests or um, some integration tests or what have you. Once those tests have completed, Jenkins releases the code to production. That's what our end-to-end -end continuous integration and delivery pipeline looks like with full communication between GitHub and Jenkins. So the way we set this up is we've configured a webhook in GitHub. Are any of you guys using webhooks? OK, so you've seen this. We simply um, go into the, each of the repos we want to monitor, and we enter a publicly accessible IP address for our Jenkins server, followed by GitHub-webhook. Um, now, in our production environment, we have an Nginx server that acts as a reverse proxy uh, that we make publicly accessible, that uh, intersects all the traffic so that we can keep our Jenkins server behind a firewall. For this demo, I'm using a tool called ngrok that intercepts all the traffic sent to this URL that I've configured and forwards it to my local host. So we're going to add that URL, and then we can select the events that we want to be notified about. 
For this end-to-end -end communication loop, I want to be notified, or rather, I would like for my Jenkins server to be notified about push events, pull requests, and repository events. The last piece is our master branch is a protected branch. I've indicated here that uh, code cannot be merged into this branch unless it's passed the defined quality checks. In this case, this is our continuous integration and Jenkins PR merge event. So what we've done is we've set up a mechanism by which GitHub and Jenkins can communicate about the state of the code, and we've locked down the master branch so that the code cannot be merged in the master unless Jenkins sends uh, a notification saying that the quality checks have passed. So this is what Jenkins looks like in my environment every day. Um, now I'm gonna take a minute and I'm gonna show you a demo. And the point of this demo is I'm gonna show you how when I bring up a brand new container for the first time, that all this functionality is available without any manual configuration. I'm going to hop over to my development machine. Can everybody see? Nobody can see that. One sec. Hey. How about now? Is that big enough? Um, so this is my development environment. It's just a virtual box running Ubuntu on my Windows machine, uh, just because that's where I prefer to develop. Um, I'm gonna show you first, this is kind of my, there's no rabbit in the hat kind of thing. I don't have any containers running. Um, and don't worry, I'm gonna explain the technology that we use behind this after the demo. I've got one container running, um, sorry, one container running, my open LDAP container. Now in production, we have authentication with an Active Directory server, but I wasn't about to try to package that thing up and bring it for a demo, so I replaced that with an open LDAP server because it's much easier to deal with. But the mechanism is the same. So all I have running is my open LDAP server. I'm going to start my Jenkins environment by running a Docker Compose up. I forgot, I need to pay tribute to the live demo gods real quickly. Good vibes, okay. Um, so it's starting. I've got some log messages in here where I've set up my private key, my credentials, and so forth. All of this is happening before Jenkins starts. So I'm just gonna wait until it tells me that Jenkins is fully up and running, and it is. And I'm gonna come over and go to my brand new Jenkins server. Have you all uh, uh, installed a Jenkins server from scratch before? Yeah? So you know how you install the server and then you have to get on a console or SSH over to the box and then go into the log file and get the default administrator password, then log in with the administrator password, and then go and configure some security, and then your users can start using it? So this is a brand new Jenkins server, and I can log in automatically with my LDAP username and password, and any members of my LDAP server are able to do that. So I'm gonna walk you through the things that were pre-configured here. The first is LDAP, as we said. This is under our configure global security setting. Well, that might be too big. I've got my server, my root DN, manager DN, and manager password. Those are the four critical pieces of information needed to customize this plugin. And keep that in mind, because I'm gonna use this to walk you through the customization of a plugin um, later after the demo. I've also got my matrix-based security plugin already configured. Now, in our production environment, of course, we have very granular levels of security where we can give different privileges to different groups, but for the demo, I just gave myself full access because it's my demo. I've got all of the credential sets I need to interact with third parties. I've got an SSH key I need to deploy to my Triton cloud. I've got two different GitHub keys. Um, I've got an SSH key, which is used for doing checkouts, and then I've got a personal access token, which is used to interact with the GitHub API, which facilitates the webhook and a couple other plugins. I've got my Docker Hub credentials so that I can push to and pull from my private Docker registry, Slack integration token, and then I've got an SSH key that allows my Jenkins master to authenticate with my Jenkins build agents. Couple other things. Jenkins. All right. We use global pipeline libraries in all of our Jenkins files. So as soon as this comes up, that plugin's configured. I've specified that this is the name I want to use to refer to that library within my Jenkins files, because that is how I've referred to it. Um, I've specified the default version, which is my master. 
uh, credential sets um, for retrieving that uh, library from GitHub and the information to do so. I've got my Slack notifications set up with some defaults, which I can override in my uh, Jenkins file, but it's nice to have the defaults there. And then finally, I've got my Docker plugin configured. I've got it set to my local host because um, for this demo, I've mounted my local Docker socket uh, so that Jenkins will use the same Docker host on which it runs to build additional Docker images and run containers. And I've specified the templates I want to use for my Jenkins build agents. I've got this default base Jenkins agent that we use for most of our work. Um, if we're just building and pushing Docker images and don't need any particular language, this is the default we use when we don't specify a node by name. We've got, also got a couple of um, APIs written in .NET Core, and for those, I specify the .NET Jenkins agent, where I've got all the, the .NET tooling installed, and I set that up to only build with uh, jobs with that label. So I've got my Docker plugin set up with my uh, templates for my build agents. I've got my library set up so that my Jenkins files can run um, as soon as they're discovered, because I've already configured the name for the plugin. Do you all know this does that, even if you made no changes? It does. So I'm going to show. Oh, come on, please. So I'm going to show you my favorite plugin. Does everybody have a favorite plugin, or is it just me? Okay. So my favorite plugin is the GitHub Organization plugin. Are you guys using that plugin? Raise your hand. Yes. Awesome. Um, if you're not using it, what this does is it allows me to configure a few things here. The name of my organization, which is just my organization's account, my DevMandy account, some credentials to scan that organization, and some credentials to check out code from that organization, and the name of the files in which um, my pipelines are stored. The default's Jenkins file, and that's what we use. So with that information set up, I'm going to save that. And this plugin is going to go and scan my GitHub organization and look at every single repo and find all the repos that contain a Jenkins file. And for each of those repos, it's going to automatically create a job. So I don't have to create any of my jobs. I just have to pre-configure this plugin, and they're created on the fly as soon as that plugin runs. So, oh, hey, it found. I'm not ready for that. But it, it, builds, um, it builds your jobs that it finds as well. So there are the jobs I have available that have um, a Jenkins file. So remember step number four when I opened the pull request back over in the slides? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop over there and do that for you. I've got, this is the pull request I've got staged. Um, this is my individual developer account where I've done a commit and pushed it to my fork, and now I'm going to create a pull request. Oh, this is over, in here, over here in GitHub. So over here, I'm a dev machine. Let's go look at pull request. I see this is my dev Mandy account. I see the pull request has been open. I see the squash and merge button is disabled. I have my yellow warning signs. And over in Jenkins, Jenkins has checked out the pull request and is building it. Oh, hey, there's a message. It's ready. It sends a message to my development team that somebody needs to go and review the code and squash and merge it. So another developer, clearly not me, another developer is going to review the code. If everything looks good, which of course it does, we're going to squash and merge. Confirm. So here I am in GitHub, squashing and merging the code because my green box is available because Jenkins has indicated that the build was successful. I'm back over here in Jenkins. When I merge that code into the master branch, I'm going to get a push event to the master branch, which is now going to kick off a build of my master branch in Jenkins. This is the build we're going to release. Jenkins is going to perform all the same steps. Um, we build the Docker image in a PR so that we can make sure that the Docker image will build. But because we're in the master branch, we're going to push this to Docker Hub. And I get another Slack notification saying, the Jenkins is waiting for authorization to deploy to production. I configured an authorization here so that we have human intervention. I have hum human intervention at two places, reviewing and merging the code and pushing to production. And this is by design. As I said, we are under the, some of the same restrictions as a financial services company. We have SOX compliance. Um, so those are the human interventions we have to have in order to, um, to be in line with the regulations. 
So I'm going to say OK, and we push to production. That's what our continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline look like. And the cool thing is, I can throw it away and start a new one and pick up right where I left off, which is hopefully what I can also do with this slide deck. No. Pardon me. Ah. All right. So do you see what we did here? We built an indispensable disposable Jenkins, just like I promised. It's really cool, but the best part is that the developers like it. They like it because it's easy to use, it saves them time, it's reliable, it's a bunch of manual stuff they don't want to do anyway. We're not pushing tools and processes on people. We're changing our culture, which goes to the very heart of DevOps. Our team believes in our continuous integration and delivery pipeline, so it's easy to get them to, do, to use it. Jenkins is doing this. Jenkins is critical to our way of life. It is so critical that we can't afford to lose it even for a few hours, not to mention the amount of time it would take to actually rebuild this monster. It's indispensable. But we've automated the installation and configuration of plugins, the creation of credential sets and jobs, and everything we need to bring up a new Jenkins environment is stored in source control, version and release, just like any other software. It's disposable. So I'm going to walk you through how we did this. Um, I'm going to start by talking at a high level about the technology that we use. Um, the first is Docker. Are you guys running Jenkins in a Docker container? Some people? Yes? Cool. So Docker is a container platform. And we run Jenkins in a Docker container because it allows us to package Jenkins in a portable format that can run on any Docker host. We happen to be running in Joyance, Triton Cloud, but this could run anywhere. AWS, Azure, Google, it's completely agnostic to the environment. I'm going to be talking a lot about container pilot. Are you guys familiar with the autopilot pattern? Anyone? So containers that implement the autopilot pattern are responsible for knowing how to perform their own startup, shutdown, scaling, recovery from failure. They're smart enough to bootstrap themselves and make themselves operational with no human intervention. It's completely automated. Container pilot is joint implementation of the autopilot pattern. It's a helper script that runs inside your container and facilitates all the autopilot behavior. It registers the container with a service catalog. In our case, we use console. Um, it performs health checks, and it does lifecycle management, which is really what allows us to facilitate this solution. So in the lifecycle management, we have the ability to run user-defined actions at various points in the lifecycle of the container, the container. We can run actions before the, the server starts and before and after it stops. Um, console is the service catalog that we use. We don't, I don't really need it for the demo, except for that it's um, a dependency of Container Pilot. But in our production Jenkins environment, we need it because we have several other services. We have traffic for load balancing, uh, Prometheus for metrics, Logly for logging, and Vault for secret management. So we need um, a service catalog to orchestrate all that. The last piece is Docker Compose, which allows us to run multi-container uh, multi applications and also allows us to specify our configuration with a Docker Compose file. So when the container starts, Container Pilot and the console agent are both running, and we are in the pre-start event of the lifecycle. At this point, Container Pilot runs the, the script that I've specified as the pre-start script. Now, Container Pilot is not going to start our Jenkins server until that script is complete and until that script is completed successfully. But when that pre-start script is complete, then and only then does it start the Jenkins server. And we also have the ability to run a periodic health check. That's um, useful if we want to determine if, say, the container itself is running, but we can't hit the Jenkins server. We can set up a curl to a Jenkins endpoint, and if it doesn't respond, then we know our Jenkins server isn't healthy. And we can also run periodic, other periodic tasks, kind of like a cron job. The last piece, Docker Compose, I want to touch on that. This is my Docker Compose file. If you've run a Docker container, uh, you probably ran something like Docker run, uh, image name, uh, maybe you specified some ports, or you mounted a volume. Everything we need to run our Jenkins container is stored in this configuration file so that it gets run the same way every time. It's just a further uh, implementation of a software-defined Jenkins. But there's also a couple of pieces I want to point out here. I specify in this Docker Compose file that I want to read environment variables from this env file. This allows me to inject data into my running container uh, at runtime to set up that environment. I'll show you that a little bit more later. 
The next thing is notice that the command I run isn't actually the Jenkins server, but Container Pilot. Um, Container Pilot is a, a supervisor application, and it's going to be the primary application, and it's going to uh, run and monitor the Jenkins server. So I'm going to show you how we've pre-configured a plugin. But let's just take a minute and just remember how plugins work. We enter data in the Jenkins UI. It gets stored in a, an XML file. There's no database. There's just several XML files in your Jenkins home directory um, and, and subdirectories of it. And then when the plugin loads, it reads from the file. Really simple. We write to the file. We read from the file. Normally, we configure plugins through the Jenkins UI. We enter data and then it gets written to an XML file that looks like this. Those four pieces of information I showed you during the demo that I really need to customize the server name, the root DN, and so forth, those are the four pieces that I need in this XML file. Typically, I log into the UI, enter that data in the UI, and then it gets written to this file. But I don't want to use the UI. I want to completely automate this and bypass the UI. So all I need to do is modify this XML file. But where am I going to get that data if I don't enter it through the UI? The Docker Compose environment file. This is my Docker Compose environment file, and I've specified on the left-hand side environment, uh, sorry, variable names, and on the right-hand side values. So when Docker Compose starts my container, it's going to read this file, and I'm going to end up with an environment that looks like this. These are all of the LDAP-related environment variables set within my running container. So now I've identified an XML file that I need to update. I've got the data stored in environment variables. I just need to get the data into the XML file. This is um, the largest snippet of code I could fit on the screen and still make it um, big enough to read. This is a snippet from the first run.sh script, which is what we run in that pre-start lifecycle event. We use a tool called XML Starlet that's just um, a bash utility that goes and finds in the XML file the specified XPath and then substitutes the value of the specified environment variable in place of the default value. So that's how we modify the XML file. The final piece of this is getting that script run. I have a container pilot configuration. When the container starts and a container pilot starts, it reads its configuration and it sees that in the pre-start event, I want it to run this script. And that's how we configure container pilot to run this. So that kind of walks you through kind of how we deconstructed the plugin, figured out how it was configured, and got to the bones of it and um, modified it before the container start. All that's facilitated by the use of Container Pilot. But what's the point? Why did we do this? What does the business want? The business wants to go fast. They're always asking us to go faster, faster, and faster. Agile and DevOps, those are ways that we can go faster. But quality is what allows us to go faster safely. And Jenkins is how we achieve quality. We've utilized some of Jenkins' advanced functionality to achieve our continuous integration and delivery pipeline. But guys, Jenkins is software. It's just code. Get in there, roll up your sleeves, deconstruct your plugins. You'll find that Jenkins is even more versatile than you even knew. Our Jenkins server is critical, and your Jenkins server is critical. Maybe you don't have a continuous integration and delivery pipeline yet. Maybe you're just building code at this point. Well, building code is really important. I guarantee that whatever functionality your Jenkins server is providing right now is critical to your team. The more we automate and depend on our Jenkins server, the more we run the risk of allowing Jenkins itself to become a single point of failure. And when something is at risk of becoming a single point of failure, the way that we eliminate that risk is by making the thing itself disposable. You guys remember the nightmare? the Jenkins server crashes. If that happens at care.com home pay, we're good. We're sleeping fine and our world keeps running. And by creating a Jenkins environment that's both indispensable and disposable, you guys can too. That's what I got for you. Um, and I have some time for questions and answers, if anybody has any. Yes? Why did you use the command transformation and not using the language for configuring Jenkins? That's a good question. Um, you know, Troy from Clobby's asked me the same thing. It's just what we chose. You could use Groovy as well. That's it, completely viable. Um, how did you put credentials in like, the credentials for Jenkins? I saw you had credentials in the plugin, but what about the credentials? Well, it's the same idea. We use um, 
a Docker Compose environment file, and then we added that information so that when Jenkins came up, it had all of our credentials stored in, um, in those environment variables. And we actually munch the private key and then demunge it when we set up the credential set and do some things like that to protect it. Um, but that's the only piece that we don't put in source control. Um, and so I could take this um, same solution and I could set up completely different set of credentials or use completely different GitHub accounts just by using different values in my Docker Compose file. Yes. Oh, sure. He was asking me how we created the credential sets. I showed you guys how we did the plugins, and it's actually the same thing. Credential sets are also stored in an XML file, um, and I pass the information into the running container via Docker Compose environment variables, and then use the XML starlet technique to update the config file with those values, just like with the plugin. It's all XML files, so. Yes. Sorry, I can't hear you. How do I do what? I'm sorry. Oh, you mean existing users? So we don't. The, the point is, just because Jenkins is disposable doesn't mean that you want to dispose of it. It's just, it's a risk mitigation mechanism so that if it dies, or if we have some sort of failure, that we can bring up a fully configured server with no human intervention. It's not meant to be uh, you know, fault free, no one's ever gonna lose their connection. It just means that if something happens, we can get our team back on track in a matter of minutes instead of days or so. Our data is disposable. As of right now, our data is disposable. So the way that we are tagging artifacts is we are tagging them in, in uh, GitHub, we are uh, building Docker images with a simver and pushing it to our Docker registry. Um, and we, right now we're not storing test data and we're looking into storing it in an external service like Nexus or Artifactory, something like that. We don't, you could. We, I'm gonna tell you, we experimented first. Before we found the solution, the first thing we did is we said, our Jenkins home is gonna be in GitHub. And as soon as we start this container, we're gonna go and check out the Jenkins home. And then we started working with that and we realized that that was more of a disaster recovery solution, which is completely viable. And you also can accomplish it with Container Pilot, but it didn't feel as dynamic as we wanted. Yes. Um, well, we were trying to manage things like, so let's say we start up a brand new Jenkins instance and we, um, we load up our Jenkins home from, from uh, source control, but then how do we manage getting updates to source control? And then we're actually storing like all of our jobs and builds and logs and we, didn't, we felt we didn't have as granular control over what we stored. Um, and that's just, it just didn't feel like the right solution for a day to day risk mitigation strategy. Yes. What about our build number? We're okay with starting over, yes. But again, I say, just because it is disposable doesn't mean that we have to kill it daily. It just means that when the inevitable happens, our server is back up and running and we're able to build and release. Yes. Yeah, once it's up, I mean, there's no reason to restart it unless we need to make a change or we have some sort of failure. We probably restart it weekly, but definitely not daily because we, we don't need to. Yes. So do you use Jenkins? Oh, we don't use Cloud Beast Jenkins, but you should. <laughs> Well, we don't, yeah, so. Is, um, uh, back to that credential question. So you're saying that you just keep the same XML file. Uh, but as far as I know, that is your uh, the secret file of the Jenkins home, the mm -hmm. XML, it's actually encrypted. Everything is encrypted. Right. And also if the secret file is changed, then, then everything is like you cannot actually decode. 
So we actually, if you store it in plain text and then start Jenkins, it'll decrypt it, I'm sorry, it will encrypt it. So you can actually add it to the Jenkins file in plain text and then Jenkins will encrypt it. So you don't have to encrypt it, but you also can call the API and encrypt it um, after the Jenkins server is up. There are, there are other ways you can do it as well. Yes. We haven't, and um, because we're using Vault for secret management, we ultimately are gonna move that over into Vault, but this is where we started. I mean, it's, it's an evolution, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, our secrets aren't available to, they're available to Jenkins, they're not available to our team. Well, that's your own local instance. I mean, you don't have, my production Jenkins, you don't have access to that. That's a controlled environment. You can run this on your local machine and do your own builds and make sure that your code builds and so forth, but just because, again, because I can run it on my laptop doesn't mean that that is how we run it. You know, we have a, an environment that's protected and has, have access controls and that sort of thing. So only people that have access to that server would be able to go and, um, and exec into that running container. Sorry. So how do you plan and have an upgrade for Jenkins and the plugins and all that? Well, it's... What are the process around that more? Sure. We don't really have an upgrade downgrade concept because it's only an upgrade if you're moving from one to the other and trying to maintain state. We just in install a new version of the plugin or install a new Jenkins and bring up a new container. So it's more like a brand new server that happens to be running that version of Jenkins and installing that version of plugins versus upgrading from one version to the next. Because there's not really a notion of bringing it up and then applying them. It's just, well, we're gonna bring it up with the new version of Jenkins and these plugin versions. So it kinda. Sort of, you, you don't have sort of a fixed list, list of your plugins and the versions you have? Or? We, we do have that, um, but if we want to upgrade one of the upgrade uh, use a newer version, we just update the file, the plugins.txt file, and spin up a, a new image and a new container. So we have new versions, but we don't go through the upgrade process. It's, we just bring up a brand new container. So you feel like, like when you get the list of upgrades in, in the Jenkins master for the plugins, you're gonna just leave them there until you are ready to yeah. to new version, to give you a new, a new core with yes. new plugins all at once? Yes, and the cool thing is, if we're interested in um, moving to a new version of Jenkins or a plugin, I can just, I can make those changes in my Docker file and experiment and test completely separate from my Jenkins production environment, but feel confident that it's an apples to apples comparison um, before I actually affect my running Jenkins instance. Yes. The tool chains are baked into the Docker image. Um, yes, that's why we have the base Jenkins agent and the .NET Jenkins agent. We have a Golang Jenkins agent. Um, we also can, from say the base Jenkins agent, which doesn't have any tooling other than Docker, do the um, in container build. I mean, there are lots of options that you can use there. And we've kind of done a combination of both, just depending on the, the situation. Yes. I'm trying to open source it. There's really no IP, but there's a lot of red tape. However, um, there, um, this first link here, Joyent did a sample implementation with um, a few plugins, and this is where we got the initial idea for it. And then we've extended it to do the full set of plugins that we want to use. So that's an excellent starting point. Their startup script is set up so that you have to be running um, in a Triton environment, so you have to kind of deconstruct that a little bit, but it's a great starting point, and that's where we started. And hopefully, um, I'll be able to open source this. And then I have a blog, the second one, that kind of walks through the steps, um, kind of like the slideshow just did, and I should be able to make the slideshow available, um, and I'm 
going to attach some screenshots from the demo just in case, well, for people who, people who didn't see it and also as a, a point of reference. But yeah, I'd love to make it open source because there are a lot of things I want to do to improve it and it would be nice to have some help um, and just some feedback from other people. Yes? That is what that means. That is the way we've, it, it isn't, um, that's the way we've chosen to do it. Um, but as I said, we store, or we, we um, tag the commits and have a Simber Docker image. We have other ways that we manage the artifacts. And the only thing that really concerns me is the test artifacts. And that's kind of something that we're exploring now with using Nexus or Artifactory or a third party tool like that so that they don't reside on our server so that when we start a new instance, they're gone. Mm-hmm. Everything is in there. So the plugin is already in there. Mm -hmm. It runs. All the jobs, I guess, it's all in there. Yes. Right? There's no mounting external mount or anything. Right. The, in, in the demo, the only external mounting is the Docker socket of the local host because that's how I'm running Docker. Um, and it, actually, in our production environment, we have a separate Docker host that we, we use for building on. But in this demo, I mounted my local Docker socket. I mean, you still could do that. There are a lot of variations to the solution that you can do. And, I mean, you could do a combination of mounting a volume where you store your job history and then just automating the configuration. It's, it's really just a starting point where you can tweak that for whatever meets the needs of your organization. Um, right now, this meets the needs of our organization, and I'm sure it'll evolve over time as we come up with different requirements and things like that. It's also different for a newer team versus a more established team where we're kind of defining the process as we go. We have a lot more leeway to kind of set that standard as we move forward. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, wow. Um, I'm going to say a mm, month-ish. I mean, we failed a lot, right, first. At first, it was like every time we tried to deal with an XML modification, it just was like pulling teeth until we kind of got the hang of the tool and got familiar with where the files lived. And you know, and part of that was like learning how to build um, a Jenkins agent because I'd done that before and getting the SSH right and then getting the tools right. So there was a lot that went into it, and you know, automating that GitHub organization plugin and figuring out the webhook. There's a, there's a lot of information that would be, you know, I'd love to write up in tutorials because we had a lot of struggles. Um, but to re-implement it now that we've been through the struggles would be, you know, maybe a week. But that's after you learn the lessons, right? Yes? What happens when? What happened? Sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. Oh, they're ephemeral. They come up, they build, and they die. So, their Docker, their Docker instances put them up. yeah, their Docker instances also. So, when they said not, does that mean that forever you you archive the archive from what? We can. We aren't right now, but as the QA architect, and I'm worried about test artifacts, that's on the radar. So when you're in a continuous no, when you're in a continuous delivery cycle, it's it's not as prevalent as you know we released in April and then three months later released another build and somebody wants to go back. It's it's kind of a different paradigm when you're releasing as regularly as we do. But um, I mean we have if we needed to run whatever we built in, on April first, we have uh, a tagged image in Docker Hub so we can retrieve it. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I'm going to leave this up here. If you guys have any questions, feel free to contact me. And thank you so much for coming.